Uh, Tonight's reading is Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5 to chapter 3, verse 6. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking, but there is a place where someone has testified. What is mankind that you are mindful of them, a son of man that you care for him? You have you made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. In putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present we do not see everything subject to them. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again he says, Here am I and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters, who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house, Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the son over God's house, and we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> Thanks, Jess. All right. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone. How are you going? Very, very good. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Andrew. I'm one of the ministers here at All Saints. Welcome to our five o'clock service. Good to have you here with us. And today we are in our second week of our series in Hebrews, okay? So um, last week, Mike opened up the series looking at Hebrews chapter 1, you know, and a little bit of the beginning of chapter 2. And as Mike mentioned last week, like the fireworks in Sydney Harbor on New Year's Eve, the book of Hebrews starts off with a bang, you know, a grand announcement, you know, a really magnificent description of Jesus. Jesus, the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, the one who sustains all things by his powerful word, the one who provided purification for all our sins, who after he destroyed the power of sin and death, sat down at the right hand of the Father, and he who is far superior to the angels in heaven. That's Jesus. It's pretty amazing. And the author wastes no time declaring the deity and superiority of Jesus Christ. And after this great declaration, he follows with a stern warning. If you trust and follow Jesus... Be careful that you don't drift away from him. Because that's what the early Christians that this letter was written to were doing. You know, they were drifting from following Jesus and going back to Judaism. And as Mike challenged us last week, this warning is also for us. Because if we're not careful, if we take the superiority of Jesus and our salvation lightly, we too can drift away. You know, we can drift away from living for Jesus and go back to our old ways of living just for ourselves. I hope the Holy Spirit helped you to identify any areas in your life where you are in danger of drifting. And this week, we'll be looking at the humanity of Jesus, you know, and what that means for us. It may come as a bit of a surprise to you guys, but um, I listen to a lot of music, 
Okay, I listen to a lot of music. I love to have little random Spotify playlists. And Spotify is very clever. As you will all know, it, it chooses songs that you probably like. You know, and for me, that's mainly music from like the 90s to the early 2000s, which I think is an excellent era of music, by the way. And Spotify played this song to me that I hadn't heard in a really long time. And it's by singer-songwriter Joan Osborne. And that song is called, What If God Was One Of Us? Now, the title of the song asks a question that I think many human beings across the ages have asked. You know, maybe it's even a question that you might have asked at some point in your life. What if God was one of us? Well, as we're going to see in this section of Hebrews, God did become one of us. And the fact that he did that means so much for all of humanity. You know, in a broken world that's tormented by sin and death, God did something spectacular to save all of us. I would like to explore two questions during the sermon, and it's why did Jesus become human, and what does Jesus' humanity mean for us? So why don't we pray and ask God for his help? Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can be gathered here today as your church. Lord, we ask that you be with us as we study your word. Help us by the power of your spirit to know and love Jesus more and to reflect that love in the way that we live our lives. All for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, if you keep your Bibles open to Hebrews 2, that would be very helpful. Cool. So after the grand announcement about the superiority of Jesus in his deity, the author of Hebrews now shifts to focus on another very important aspect of Jesus, and that is his humanity. So why does Jesus' humanity matter? Well, the author reminds us in verse 5 that it is not to the angels that God has subjected the world to come. So the world to come means God's future kingdom, all right? And our attention is now being brought back to God's original plan for humanity. With the writer quoting Psalm number 8, Psalm 8 reflects upon the role of humanity. And Hebrews 2, quoting from Psalms 8, says this, What is mankind that you are mindful of them? A son of man that you care for him. You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. So what's the author talking about here? You know, why is he quoting Psalm number 8? Well, last term, if you remember, in our Genesis series, we learned about creation. You know, how God's intention was for humankind to have dominion over the earth and to take care of it, right? Well, verses 6 to 8 reminds us about God's original intention for humankind. That although humans are a little lower than angels, as if, as if humans, you know, they are, we're physical, angels are spiritual. You know, God didn't, though, give angels the kind of dominion that human beings have over the earth. God crowned human beings with glory and honor. However, as we continue in verse 8, we're going to be presented with a problem, a problem that you and I are experiencing as, our lives, as we live our lives here in 2024. Let's carry on in verse 8. In putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet, at present, we do not see everything subject to them. So if you remember the creation account in Genesis 1, God made humankind in his image, and he gave us the unique responsibility of ruling over his good creation as his chosen representatives. Now, would you say that we've been ruling over God's creation the way that he intended us to? Would you say that human beings have everything well under their control right now? No, it's absolutely not. Just look at the mess we live in today. You know, we have pollution, we have waste, we have poverty and need, injustice and crime, we have destruction and war. You know, if anything, I say that human beings have spun the whole world out of control. And why? Well, because sin has destroyed our ability to carry out God's original plan for us. And as much as we strive to become better and more intelligent people, as much as we try to take medical advancements to live longer, as much as we try to make all sorts of technological advancements to have dominion over this creation, like somehow we can bring it all under our control, it seems futile, doesn't it? We can see that creation is not subject to us at all. The author of Hebrews knows this, which is why he urges us to look beyond our own flawed humanity, and he points us to look at Jesus' perfect humanity. Verse 9, but we do see Jesus, who was made lower than angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, 
so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. You know, as the writer did in chapter 1, and he continues to do this throughout the book, the writer of Hebrews quotes Old Testament scriptures just to show that their fulfillment comes in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So Jesus, by becoming human, he fulfills the role that humanity was meant to play. Jesus is the one who is now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death in our place. In becoming human, Jesus made our salvation possible by living the perfect life, you know, by giving it up on the cross to die and pay for our sins, and by rising from the dead, defeating the curse of sin and death. And by doing that, Jesus became the pioneer of our salvation, the first among many to enter into God's glory. Verse 10, in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. So the writer is saying that in his humanity, Jesus was able to fulfill his role as our Savior through his experience of suffering and death. Jesus' human life, death, and resurrection paved the way for many to be saved. Jesus had to become human for salvation to be possible for us. Now, in comparing the sin of Adam to the righteousness of Jesus, Paul says this in Romans 5. Have a look at this. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as though the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. So where Adam's disobedience brought sin and death, Jesus' obedience all the way to suffering and dying on the cross for us, it brought redemption and restoration to all who would trust in him. So like a military leader who chooses to go fight in the trenches with his soldiers instead of just leading from the sidelines, Jesus became human. He became human to suffer and die for our sake, to become the pioneer of our salvation through his life, death, and resurrection. Jesus came to earth, shared, it in, shared in our humanity so that he could fully relate to our human existence. And it's not like Jesus chose the easiest path as well. You know, he didn't come to earth as a wealthy king. He didn't only associate with the righteous and well-off in society. No, Jesus traveled from town to town. He hung out with the social outcasts. And he hung out with those the religious elite didn't even want anything to do with. Jesus would have witnessed and experienced the good, the bad, and the ugliest of humanity. And yet, he still died for us. Through suffering, Jesus became our complete and fully qualified Savior, able to stand before God on our behalf, knowing exactly what it meant to be human. He didn't take shortcuts. He didn't bypass any pain. He faced the full weight of humanity's brokenness, and he came out victorious, perfectly fulfilling the law, completing his role as Savior as he tasted death for everyone. But not only that, he calls those who trust in him his brothers and sisters. Verse 11, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Now tell me, do you find that hard to believe? You know, that Jesus is not ashamed to call us his family. I mean, I know what I'm like, and I must admit that there are times where I do find this hard to believe. The perfect son of God, the eternal king of the universe calls me his brother. How can that be? That is the amazing grace and love of God. You see, Jesus didn't only come to redeem us from sin. He came to restore our identity as children of God, holy and set apart to share in his kingdom. And the author, once again, he cites Old Testament scriptures from Psalm 22 and Isaiah 8 just to show us how Jesus fulfills these scriptures as he calls us his family. Jesus' humanity makes our adoption into God's family possible. God doesn't see us as just some distant created beings. God sees us as sons and daughters, with Jesus as our brother. Verse 14, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil and free those who all of their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Death is the ultimate consequence of sin. And praise God, 
that because Jesus shared in our humanity and died for us, Satan no longer has power over anyone who comes to God through faith in Jesus. We no longer need to fear death because the one who once held the power of death has now been defeated by Jesus. We who believe in this can share in his victory. Jesus, fully God in every way and also fully human in every way, sharing our human experience of pain and suffering and even suffering as he was tempted, but never fail, he never sinned. And he helps those of us who are being tempted. What a comfort it is to know that Jesus fully understands what it means to be human. And Jesus' humanity isn't just some kind of theological concept, okay? Jesus' humanity shows us that although our Savior is rightfully superior and much higher than all things, He chose to fully relate to all our deepest needs and struggles, all the things that we go through in our lives. You ever think that God doesn't understand you? Ever think that God couldn't possibly know what it's like to walk in your shoes? Well, remember that he has walked this path before us. He's not some passive cosmic being who idly sits in heaven watching us. Rather, taking the very nature of the servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So what if God was one of us? Well, I hope that after going through the passage today, you truly understand that God did indeed become one of us. And by doing so, he not only redeemed us from our sin, but he completely restored humanity's relationship with God and our identity as people created in his image. And Jesus, the pioneer of our salvation who brings many sons and daughters to glory, he's not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. He prepared the way for us so that we could rule with him forever in the new heaven and new earth. Friends, when you leave here today, I hope you can take some time to really ponder and reflect upon what you just heard. Maybe chat amongst your brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe spend some time in prayer. Or maybe even better, do both. Do it together. I hope and pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll be able to fully embrace your identity in Christ and finding comfort in knowing that Jesus completely understands what it means to be human. I hope and pray that you'll be able to continually fix your thoughts and your eyes upon Jesus this week and do it all for God's glory. Amen.